It's the holiday season, and today I'm gonna to tell you how you can buy your very own time machine that doubles as a teacher, a lifelong hobby, and possibly a profitable career. And by the way, it costs under $50. Today we're going into the impossible with the gift that transformed me from a nerdy, introverted, pimple-faced kid to a professor of physics. It changed my life forever. And today I'll give you tips to do the same for the kid in your life too. On this channel, I aspire to inspire you to always be curious, ABC, by sharing ways to stoke imagination with lessons from the greatest minds in history and from the present. And speaking of presents, it's the holiday season. And in today's special holiday edition is dedicated for you to find the perfect choice for a gift for the curious kid in your life. In many previous videos, I've discussed the Bicep Astronomical Telescope and my exploits at the South Pole, the very bottom of the world. Bicep is actually a very simple refracting telescope. It uses lenses, and instead of focusing light on your eyes, as you would with a small optical telescope like this, it focused onto very sensitive superconducting transition edge sensor bolometer detectors. But half the fun of doing Bicep is getting to go to the South Pole. It's the most remote place on Earth, and you can only reach it for a tiny window in the year. And while you're there, you might be surprised to find all these astronomers congregating around without any astronomical objects whatsoever to look at, except for two, the sun and the moon. Those are the only two objects visible during the summertime season, which lasts from approximately December 21st to March 21st at the South Pole, out of phase with the Northern Hemisphere seasons. And during that daytime, a single day, the sun is above the horizon 24-7. Of course, you can't really tell the days are passing, except if you note the path, the circular arc path, that the sun and the moon both make. The moon takes a full month to get around in its orbit around the Earth, and so you can actually use the moon as a sort of crude timekeeping device. Its phase and its position can help the poor astronomer stranded there, such as myself, uh, to actually observe the passage of time. I've spent about a month or so at the South Pole, and I've been there twice. It's been a fascinating journey to get from San Diego down to the bottom of the world. And it's fascinating to note that the very object that took me there was the moon. The moon guided me on a direct path from being a child fascinated with the sky to the cosmology career that I enjoy today. And today I'm going to take you on a journey, along with me, of curiosity and discovery back to when I was an unpopular, pimple-faced kid in upstate New York. It all began in Dobbs Ferry, New York, 4 a.m., the middle of summer, 1984. Are you kidding me? I left the lights on again? But wait a second, the light was off. The light shining into my bedroom was coming from outside my room. In fact, it was coming from the heavens above. It was the moon. It was plump, it was full, it was low on the horizon as sun was preparing to rise in the east, the moon was setting in the west. But the moon was not alone. It was brighter than any street light, and yet its companion nearby to it was bigger, apparently, than any star I'd ever seen, and it was rivaling the moon in every attempt at brightness. It looked like a mesmerizingly bright star, but it couldn't be a star, it had to be a plane. Maybe it was American Airlines Flight 137 on its way somewhere exotic because what kind of star could rival the brightness of the moon? I was 13 years old, and I had never seen anything like it. For the next few nights, I watched the moon and its brilliant companion arc across the humid Indian summer skies over Westchester County. I was perplexed and mesmerized. I simply had to find out more about the celestial companion to the brilliant and beautiful moon. Now, this being 1984, Google was about 14 years in the future. I had no desire nor patience to wait that long to find out what was going on in the skies above Dobbs Ferry. Back then, I had no other choice but to wait until the Sunday New York Times came out with a section called Cosmos. And in the Cosmos section were depictions of what the celestial sights above us, the zodiac, the planets, and, and so forth, would be visible from the New York City area. And back then, I was an altar boy in the Catholic Church. So after church services ended, I grabbed Sunday's New York Times paper, and I was hit with a revelation more exhilarating than any church sermon I'd ever heard. 
The star I thought I observed. The star I thought I discovered. The plane that wasn't ever moving was not a star. It was not a plane. It was the planet Jupiter. But how is that possible? How could you see an actual planet without a telescope or a spaceship? How could another world be visible to my naked eyes? Now, it was a short leap to think about what brilliant illuminations one could see if I had a telescope. I just had to get one. But given my family's meager means, finding a spare 50 bucks for the cheapest spy glass I could get my hands on would be a challenge. Fortunately, in 1984, I had had a summer job stocking shelves at the Venice Deli in Dobbs Ferry, making a cool $3.35 for each of the four hours of hard labor I could put in each week. Eh, it was going to take quite a while, six weeks at least, to earn enough money to buy a telescope on my own. By then, summer would be long over. I'd be back at school, and I wouldn't have any time to use the telescope. And possibly, for all I knew, the brilliant planet Jupiter would have disappeared from the sky. How could I possibly obtain the magical tool to slake my astronomical thirst to know more about the cosmos? Well, I was lucky. I had a very generous three-letter funding agency that has traditionally been the first funding agency of choice for many, many young budding scientists. Instead of considering a life of crime with the local branch of the Soprano crime family, I was a little bit too pudgy to gain entry into them anyway. Never had the makings of a varsity athlete. I beseeched the three-letter funding agency. Not the NSF, not the DOE, not the DOD, but the MOM. My mother, Barbara. My mom instantly saw that I was putting in a little bit of my own due diligence, trying to earn money to earn the right to have this telescope, but also that she could supplement and boost my curiosity far beyond any other present one could imagine. And so she generously supplemented my scrimpings and gave me a generous grant. Soon I became the principal investigator, the PI, over my very own two-inch diameter refracting telescope with adjustable magnification eyepiece. As soon as I got my hands on the telescope, night couldn't come quickly enough. After battling some cloudy, late summer haze, I was able to turn the tiny little telescope heavenward and just put it in a place in the middle of the street for just long enough to avoid getting run over by passing cars. I was addicted. Every single night, I would take the telescope out, even if it was cloudy. Within hours, that very first night, I saw Jupiter's moons, a retinue of four brilliant little dots surrounding the king of the planets, like a heavyweight boxer and his jostling entourage heading towards the ring. Just like that, I had quadrupled the number of moons I had seen in my life. Later that night, I saw the highest mountains and deepest craters on the moon's surface. It was overwhelming. Then I turned my telescope to the Milky Way, looking at colorful stars of near infinite variety. Soon I discovered diaphanous deep sky objects such as nebulae and galaxies. They came into crisp focus. But this telescope did more than just make me an observer of the heavens. I became a celestial evangelist, trying, mostly in vain, to convince others of the wonders of the heavens, maybe even just to look up. Most of us spend our lives nowadays looking down at our phones, barely looking up above the horizon. Try it for yourself. See how uncomfortable you feel looking at a 45 degree angle, let alone a 90 degree angle. It's very unusual for us nowadays. And even back then, it wasn't so common. I'd wait for people walking down my street to take a peek, and I would show them these wonderful sights. And showing the public the visual delights with my telescopes was a little bit of a mixed bag. Some people got it, but many didn't. Some would ask me, can we look at your neighbor girl again? Or worse, do you mean that little smudge in the eyepiece? Oh, <laughs> that's it. But when I needed some extra convincing, I'd call in the ringer, Saturn. Even the most jaded video game addict was left slack-jawed after glimpsing the magnificently disked, cream-colored world we call Saturn. It has its own moons too, including Titan, an enormous, almost Earth-sized moon. My telescope became my time machine. It took me on a ride to otherworldly vistas. And it can do the same for you. 
the telescope had a secondary, ancillary benefit. It caused me to want to investigate to learn more about the objects I was seeing each night. So during the day, I would examine these objects, not on the internet, which didn't exist yet, but in books, magazines, and anything printed I could get my hands on. It was quite difficult. I needed more than what I could get from the New York Times once a week. So I devoured all the astronomical media I could ever find. And scared the socks off some poor librarian. I subscribed to Astronomy Magazine for about 20 bucks a year. That was most of my savings for my week's worth of work. Uh, and I'm still delighted to have contributed to about two or three articles in Astronomy Magazine, oh, those many years later, as a professional astronomer. I also engaged in real research, keeping a very simple logbook, just a marble notebook with a pencil attached to it by a rubber band so that my older brother wouldn't steal it from me. And I would write down and sketch out the images that I was seeing through the telescope. Certainly, CCD cameras were years in the future and would not be affordable of someone of my modest means. So instead, I had to sketch it, and that brought out fine details, details I wanted to learn more about. So the more I learned, the more precious these sites became to me, and especially so when I read about them in the Bible. All right, not the actual Bible. Rather, it was the Peterson Field Guide to the Stars and Planets, and it became my celestial scripture. I'd read the guide all day, anxiously awaiting nightfall a pimple-faced Astro Dracula craving the quiet shelter of the night sky. I still have my original copy of the Peterson Guide. It's in my office at UC San Diego, and it proudly bears the autograph of its author, Jay Pasikoff, professor of astronomy at Williams College. I've been delighted to visit Jay and give lectures at Williams College and for him to come here to UC San Diego. None of that would have been possible if I didn't discover the night sky. Yes, so that's all that counts. That's it became a time machine as well as being a social engineering machine to get to know some of the most celestial of all intellects on Earth. Even now, when I read the book, when I leaf through it, any night of the year, the scent of the pages, their crisp colors, it takes me back to being a 13-year-old again, yet another form of time travel. Now. The guide also contained extensive scientific discussions of the planets, and it showed me how to observe them. For each planet, there was a brief description of how the great and first optical astronomer to use a telescope, Galileo Galilei, how he perceived it when he looked through his own arm-length spyglass 400-plus years earlier. Eventually, Galileo's observations led him to believe that Copernicus, not Aristotle or Ptolemy, were right. The sun, not the earth, was the center of the universe. He couldn't keep that discovery to himself. And of course, he wrote, eventually wrote the Dialogo, the dialogue on the two world systems, Aristotelianism, Peripateticism, and of course, Copernicanism. And I am overjoyed that another byproduct of my early exploits into astronomy has now paid dividends, 40 years later almost. And that's that I am with my friends Carlo Ravelli, Lucio Picciarillo, Fabiola Giannate, Jim Gates, and Frank Wilczek, recording the first ever audiobook version of the dialogue. Stay tuned to this channel for more information about that wonderful project coming soon. Now, when I learned after reading about Galileo's descriptions of the discoveries that he made centuries earlier, he had done the exact same thing I had done, turned it to the brightest things in the sky. Jupiter, Saturn, he didn't turn it to the sun, but the moons of Jupiter were his timepieces, his celestial diamonds. I had done the same thing as the great Galileo. Now, of course, it wasn't that I was originating these discoveries. Of course, he made them hundreds of years earlier. But I had the exact same visceral experience, I'm convinced, that the great maestro did as well. And of course, it was cute that there was a connection between the maestro and myself, that we were both supported, in some sense, by Venetian patrons. His, the Doge and Senate of Venice, and mine, the Venice Deli. And I wanted to emulate Galileo in every way possible, except for that final last chapter of uh, home imprisonment and semi-threats of being tortured. <laughs> Let's avoid that. And even at that time, in 1984, Galileo had never been even issued a formal apology. He still hasn't been pardoned by the Catholic Church. But at least in uh, the late 80s, early 90s, uh, Pope John Paul did issue a statement that he was correct, if not actually pardoning him. 
working on the dialogue with these phenomenal educators, Frank, Fabiola, Carlo, Lucio, and Jim Gates, working with them really reminds me of what the word educate really means. The word educate comes from the Latin phrase educare. I think Fabiola could do a better job pronouncing it than I can. Thanks for you. But that word means to bring out of, not to pour into. We educators are always searching for ways to enhance the learning process, to make it more visceral, more resonant with our students, in order to bring out the best within them. Imagine if you could replicate the thrill, the visceral excitement that the physicists at the Large Hadron Collider, including Fabiola, felt when they discovered the Higgs boson particle in 2012. You actually didn't have a single discovery event. But you couldn't even do that unless you happened to have a spare $10 billion or so lying around, and then you could roll your own LHC. But I doubt that's true for you. It certainly wasn't true for me. And yet, for $50, you can get your own telescope, and you yourself can replicate the feeling of discovery that Galileo felt over 400 years ago. How often is that possible in science? It's a very rare experience to have a connection in history between the first discoverer of something and a student. And best of all, if you do that, if you go out and buy a telescope, for you or for your own uh, children, you and I can be connected as well, feeling the same feelings that I felt, which is what I strive for in communicating the deep impact that astronomy has had on me. And we'll share it as two astronomers. It doesn't matter if you're professional or not. Once you unlock the mysteries of the cosmos through a small telescope, you'll be able to be bonded with all the astronomers throughout history. You'll become a universal voyager, just like me. So parents, any parents out there, go out there and buy a telescope for a kid in your life, or just get one for you. You can see the exact same objects Galileo saw 400 years ago, even from the middle of Manhattan. You can see the craters on the moon, the rings of Saturn, the moons of Jupiter, the phases of Venus, and millions of other phenomena. One day I'll start my own Keating brand telescope company because I've probably sold more telescopes to parents and friends around the world than Isaac Newton himself. What's it gonna take to get you into a Keating brand Star Spotter 2000? I'll include Simon Isaac and undercoated, and I'll throw in these wheeled tripods for free. Remember, ABC, always be curious, or is it always be closing? Basically, take the telescope out as soon as you get it, read the instructions, put it together, and point it at the first bright object you see in the sky. But not the sun, okay? <laughs> That's my only disclaimer. Warning, do not look at the sun with your remaining eye. I want you to be able to watch my Into the Impossible videos for decades to come. So there you have it. That's how I went from a pimple-faced pudge ball to a professor, from a dweeb in Dobbs Ferry to a star seeker at the South Pole, from being a shy, introverted preteen to getting to hang out on Captain Kirk's unexplained TV discussing the wonders of the moon. And it's all thanks to a tiny little telescope that I got when I was a kid many, many decades ago. And I hope you will do the same for the child in your life. I'll put some links to great telescopes for any budget on my blog at briankeating.com. Just click here to access it. Leave a comment in the comment section below about how it felt when you or your child first saw the craters on the moon. If you wanna hear more about my astronomical journey, click here to see my Google talk, or click here to see an interview with some of my astronomy buddies debating the greatest mysteries in cosmology and astronomy today.